Uh, we have a couple of visitors with us, and I wanted to say thank you to the visitors for being here. Uh, we always appreciate having uh, new people to come and worship with us and celebrate God with us and talk about the great sacrifice that Jesus went through uh, for us. If you have not filled out a visitor's card, I'd uh, appreciate you doing so. Uh, they are on the table in the back foyer. Uh, also, we have a, a bulletin that if, helps you follow along with the sermon. If you want one of those, I just want to make sure to mention that for you. Uh, a little fill in the blanks to help you, you follow along with what can sometimes be longer than should be sermon. So we're uh, going to go ahead and jump in so that it's not too long today and talk about some more concepts of fellowship. I have noticed, I don't know if you have, but I have noticed over the years that there has been a shift in the way that we sing the national anthem. Uh, I, I know when, you know, I'm only 41 years old, but when I was a kid, every kid learned the words of the national anthem. Uh, we had the Pledge of Allegiance in school every single day. Uh, we even, when I, my early years, still said prayers as a class. I remember that shifted to a period of silence after a while, and I don't think there's probably even that today in most schools. Uh, but I do remember whenever we would sing the national anthem, it was something that the crowd participated in. Do you remember those days? Uh, somebody would get up a microphone, they'd sing the national anthem, and everybody else would sing along with it, and it was wonderful, and it created a certain sense of patriotism, and we've changed that that now the national anthem is rarely a sing-along as much as it is a performance. And you don't sing along because who knows what notes they're going to hit next, and nobody can go quite that high as that you know, one note in the national anthem because they really like to screech it out there higher than any human should be able to actually sing. So it's created a more of a, a performance or a consumer-based event instead of a participation event. That same trend has happened in the church. The church has shifted in a lot of ways from being more participatory and more congregational or community focused to being more consumer focused. This is why I believe back a few months ago when everything was shut down and all the services were online, even here, that there were too many Christians absolutely just fine with that. I'm not saying it was a wrong thing to do, and I think it was a good temporary measure in order to allow us to still worship together or at least still study together in some form or fashion. My problem is not as much with the event happening, but with the satisfaction with it happening. Because it shows me that we are no longer very focused on participating in worship as much as we are in observing worship. And that's concerning. Because the Bible is so very clear that fellowship the community, the being together with God's people, the, the participation of God's people together, doing the things of God, is essential for us being the church. From the very beginning, Acts 2.42, all of these lessons we've been teaching have been based on, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And we have argued in this series of lessons that if there are four things that we as Christians should be identified, four activities that we should be focusing on as God's people, it's these four things. We should be sharing the apostles' teaching together. We should be fellowshipping and building this community together. We should be breaking bread together and praying together. That's what they worked on. The consumerist approach to worship in church, though, is anti-fellowship. You see, the church, in the church, as God designed it, there's work to do that requires everybody to participate. Well, a consumerist approach is somebody else will do the work and I'll just benefit. Or there, there's this sense in which 
You are to get, you get directly out of something what you put into it. But if we put nothing into worship, what do we expect to get out? The concept that, that we're never described as the audience of worship, which means worship isn't about what pleases me, it's about what pleases God. Yet how many discussions and arguments have you heard over the years about worship being pleasing to us? not really what it's about and I think the pictures of fellowship or the pictures of God's church you have in scripture display that for us we're not going to look at all these verses but they're on your bulletin and so I encourage you to go and look at these yourself as you have time uh, but we as the church are described as a building I know we have spent years saying the church is not the building but it is God's building uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to read here verse 9. For we are God's co-workers, you are God's field, God's building. We are God's building. And here I think the reference is to the concept of us being the temple. We're described as that over in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, supposed to be uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, we're described as the temple of God. Uh, maybe it is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 going, nope, that's not it either. Uh, over here, we're told 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16, and what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And so we are the temple of God. We are described as a building. And what's interesting is how often the Bible talks about every piece of the building, that every piece that is built into the building does its part. And it talked about that at length over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, here, also this idea of, of uh, we are a team, we are people who work together. If you read the whole context here of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, do not become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the people of God have with idols? And so that idea of we are people who work together, we are people who partner together in the work we are supposed to be doing. Uh, over in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, Hebrews 4 verse 9 tells us, Therefore a Sabbath rema remains for God's people. Uh, the word uh, community can be used there too, God's community. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 25, over here we're told, uh, that we should choose to suffer, or Moses chose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. How often is it that we are called a people of God? First Peter talked about that we were once not a people, but now we are the people of God. It means we're a community. We are a group that gathers together for God's purposes. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, John 1, 12, Ephesians 2, 19 and following, call us a family. We are told that we are adopted into the family of God, that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, Romans chapter 8. We are family if we are the church. Later, we're called a body. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We won't read this whole long passage, but starting here in verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, through though many are one body, so also is Christ. For when we are ba all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not made of one, but many. The foot cannot say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. 
for, if not for that reason, any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wants. Romans chapter 12 talked about a similar idea. But I want to skip over to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 says here, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. As a part of the body, I have a part to play. I have a role. If I don't do my role, the body becomes deficient. Isn't that what it says here? We're described as a flock. Jesus is the good shepherd over in the Gospel of John. The shepherds of the flock, meaning the elders, the bishops, they are told to shepherd the flock of God that is among them. Jesus is called the chief shepherd by Peter over in 1 Peter chapter 5 because we are a group of sheep that gather together to follow our Lord. And then we already read over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 the idea that we are a field. And then John 15 talked about the idea that we are a vineyard or a vine and we are the branches that are attached to the stem of the vine and that all of these, uh, we, we all have to, be grafted in the vine, be a part of the vine, be a part of the group if we are going to be a productive part of the church. Now, I bring all of this. I know that was a ton of verses really fast. I know you didn't turn to them all. That's fine. Look them up later. I want you to note a couple of things. There's a lot of directions we could go, and we could probably spend an entire sermon or two on each one of these pictures. We don't have time for that. But I do want to make some, what I think are some pretty obvious, but maybe forsaken conclusions on what we as the church are if we are truly going to be in fellowship with each other and with God. All of these pictures that we have here, the building, the community, the family, the body, the flock, even the field, all of these pictures show us this. It is necessary for God's people to be interdependent and attached to each other. You take a vine, a branch off the vine, what happens to it? Dies. If a sheep wanders away from the flock, what happens to it? It gets killed. If my finger falls off my hand, I can no longer make a really important point anymore, right? I mean, it, if, if a piece of my body falls off, everybody goes, what is wrong with his body? Attachment, interdependence, the idea that we are so attached to each other that we don't function without each other is a part of the illustrations that we have regarding the church. Yet I'm not sure that that's the way we often view the church. You know, we tend to view the church sometimes like, you know, it, it was kind of nice not to have to get dressed up nice on a Sunday morning and drive all the way down there. That, that's a 25-minute drive to get to that church building. And, and then I got to sit there for a couple of hours and, you know, it... it Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not, and Adam always preaches over. And we find all of these reasons why we, we, it would just be easier to just not be there. But that doesn't show interdependence. That doesn't show attachment. That shows that we are by name a part of something, but really a part of something that we we are associated but we're not really dependent 
That is never the picture of the church. This is why I think you can see so much what I like to call flock flopping, especially in places like Birmingham and Tampa and Houston and there, where there's a lot of churches in a pretty close area where it's just, you know, I don't like that preacher and what he said, so I'm just going to go somewhere else. Or, or I just, I, that person rubbed me the wrong way or the person didn't talk to me. And so instead of dealing with the problem, instead of saying, hey, there's a problem in this body that needs to be fixed, and that problem might be me, what we do is we just flock flop. We just go somewhere else. You know why it's easy to go somewhere else? Because you weren't attached to the first one. You can't easily leave something you are attached to. And when you are attached to something and it has to be unattached, that is Typically painful, but not with flock flopping. I, I tell you, I got concerned for a little while about Christians I know in a lot of different places during the whole pandemic and 2020 season of how many people were just so okay with things. I, I'm not saying it was wrong for us to have made temporary measures and to do the best we could do with the information we had and to do the things that we had to do for a time. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be cautious about the virus uh, and, and, and to be careful and to limit exposure and do those types of things if there's a reason. If, while you are separated, you desire to be there, my difficulty is how many Christians I talked to who expressed a lack of desire to be there. That, that's dangerous. That reveals a lack of fellowship between that person and that community. That person's not truly attached to that community whatsoever if they are so flippantly involved and so easily pulled away. That's not the pictures we have in Scripture. I'm going to tell you, I, I think the greatest display of this interdependence and attachment that you have in God's people is God's people's willingness to be hospitable. I, I will tell you right now, the strongest churches I have ever seen or been a part of are also the most hospitable. And the weakest churches that I have ever been a part of have always been the least hospitable. You know, there is a reason, I believe, that in both Timothy and Titus, when there is a description of the elders, one of the things that is said that is characteristic of a man who is going to lead God's people is that he is a hospitable person. The reason that is so important is not because we just want to see how good he grills. The reason it's important is because we need to be in one another's homes if we are truly going to know and be dependent on one another. How hospitable are we as a community? Because that by itself is one of the greatest tests you can give as to whether we truly have fellowship or not. You also see this sense of community in all of those pictures of fellowship we looked at. Now, I'll be honest, I wish we would call ourselves a community, not a congregation. I know that sounds, you know, you know that, I, I get that, because it's not what we're used to. But, but here's why. The, the word congregation is stiff. It's just a stiff word. I'm not saying it's a wrong word. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with the word community, and honestly, it's whichever word you're used to hearing. I'm used to hearing congregation, but one of the reasons I, I struggle with that word a little bit is because it has become so stiff, so formal, so churchy, that we see it as this 
separated part of our lives, not part of our everyday life. We, are, we have this congregation that we're a part of on Sundays and Wednesdays, and then we have life. Whereas community is more of the sense of it's an everyday thing. It is something that is a part of our interaction with the, with the world at large. That is our community. It's where we live. It's who we associate with. It's who we identify with, which we'll come back to that in a moment. I wish we'd used the word community. It's interesting to me that when you look through Scripture, that there is there is such a um, an emphasis on this. You know, we talk a lot about things like evangelism, right? That that we 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 like to talk about evangelism. Some of us more than others, guilty as charged. I, I know we we like to talk about evangelism. Do you realize there are over a hundred commands in the New Testament alone about how we are to treat one another, and there are a handful of commands about evangelism? That's a dramatic difference. A handful. And yet we'll talk about evangelism as if it is this great responsibility that we have, and we got to be doing it. Now, I'm not disagreeing with that. We do. But if only a handful of verses can give us that great responsibility towards evangelism, what should over a hundred commands make us want to do? Absolutely build this community with one another. It's what we've got to do if we're going to be God's people. And I'm going to tell you that even in the Great Commission, and you're welcome, I, I put more details about this in the article on the front of your bulletin, so feel free to read it, but uh, the, the word go at the beginning of the Great Commission, we completely misunderstand that word. That word in Greek, is, and I'm going to go nerdy on you for just a second, I'll explain it in a moment, but the word is an aorist passive participle, Okay? Not an imperative, not a command, not a, an action word. We translate it and think of it as an action word. That's really not what it is. It is an aorist passive participle, which should be translated something like this. As you are being made to go about. It was a lot easier to just type G-O. I mean, it's... It, As you are being made to go, as you're going about your day-to-day life, as as every day brings about your activities, as you do the work of every day, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's not a go do this, it's a do it all the time as you live day-to-day. That's the idea. And the things that we're supposed to be doing day to day, every single day, as we go about our activities, we are to be making disciples. How do you do that? You baptize them and teach them. That's how this works. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That involves community. I, I, it, the idea is not to go somewhere, but to, as you live in your community, Baptize and teach, baptize and teach, baptize and teach, baptize and teach. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Identity is an important part of all those examples that we just looked at. The temple had a particular identity, did it not? The identity of belonging to God. A team has an identity in the work that it is going about doing. A family has a name and an identity. The body has an identity. It is its individual thing. The flock belongs to the shepherd. The field or vineyard belongs to the vineyard owner. It it is used and purposed for a thing. And we're no different in our identity. But I think in a lot of ways we've lost it. We have identified under the name Church of Christ. And there has been a movement in the past probably two decades to unidentify because we want to say, well, we are only Christian, right? 
I've even seen bumper stickers that were put out by Church of Christ groups that say, only Christians. Dot com. You know, that, that's all we are. We're only Christians. Here's the problem with that. I agree with it. We are, uh, First Peter, or First Corinthians chapter 3 talked about we don't call ourselves after Paul. We don't call ourselves after Cephas. We don't call ourselves after Apollos. We only call ourselves after Christ, right? So we're only Christians. I, I agree with that. Here's the problem with it. We have let ourselves generalize our faith and identity in such a way that we no longer have something to which we belong. We haven't taught particularly young people what being only a Christian is all about. And so they have a loose understanding as to what their identity is. I think that's dangerous. Now, I'm not saying we need to go back to identifying ourselves under some sort of subheading, Christian meaning Church of Christ, or, or, or anything like that. What we need to do is this. We need to identify by being a Christian, and we need to be so connected to the community which Christ has given us, have both sides of it. I'm not saying we need a name and we need to name the community. I'm saying we need to be so attached to the community that it's not an issue. Another, another common theme you have in those, those examples is confidence. Confidence. I, I'm going to tell them myself. I, I used to, you know, pe- being a preacher, as long as I've been a preacher, I've been asked dozens and not hundreds of times of, well, you're, you're the people that think you're the only ones going to heaven. And years ago, I heard an answer to that that I've used over the years, and this is wrong. This is bad for me. to. I'm just going to preface it with that before I say it. But the answer I heard to give kind of tongue-in-cheek was, well, that can't be true because I'm not even sure all of us are going to heaven. Shame on me. You know what my answer should be? I'm making no judgments about anybody outside of our fellowship, but I'll tell you right now, I know that our fellowship, our community, is going to heaven. That should be the answer. Because the accusation is not you people all think you're going to heaven and that's pompous, which is really kind of what my... My, my learned answer was, no. The accusation is you think no one else is going to heaven, and, and that's, not, that's not really true either. But I'll be honest, I can't give an answer for everybody else, but I should be able to give an answer to my brothers and sisters with whom I am in fellowship. I should be able to do that. I should know them and be such a tight-knit community with them that, yes, I have no doubt whatsoever that brother or sister so-and-so that I meet with regularly, that I talk to regularly, that I build a relationship with, that they are going to heaven because if I think they're not going to heaven, you better believe I love them enough to have a conversation with them about why that is, and I hope they've done the same with me so that we can encourage and pride and push one another toward heaven. Isn't that the way this should work? That should create confidence in us as God's people. Fellowship builds confidence. And we need to have that. Another theme you see through this whole thing is a a commonality or a unity. Acts chapter 2, which we've studied recently, says they held all their possessions in common. Acts chapter 4 says they were of one heart and soul, meaning they believed in common. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 said they had common judgment, that they judged matters of dispute commonly together so that they could make right conclusions. And then we've read earlier, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 through 15, this idea of not being tossed by waves and blown about by every wind of teaching, by human craftiness with cleverness and the teaching, the techniques of deceit, but instead we're growing together by doing what each part must do in order for us to grow. Jesus prayed 
over in John 17, that if we would be one people, people would turn to God. Jesus taught over in John 13, 35, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It is amazing to me how often Jesus taught that our fellowship leads to evangelism. Our fellowship leads to growth. Our fellowship is the bedrock, our foundation for everything else we are as God's people. Without fellowship, we really have nothing. You know, if we would work on that kind of fellowship, we'd have it. But without it, we got nothing. We are merely a group of strangers meeting together, fulfilling our obligations. And I'll be honest, I wonder if that's not a more apt description of God's church in too many places. Strangers that meet together to fulfill their obligations. Oh, I pray that's not us. I, I pray that we are so sold out for what God has called us to be that like in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20, our God is a consuming fire, an all-consuming fire. If you're not consumed by who God is and what he has provided for you, then you don't really know the truth. I don't know how to put it any other way than that. This type of fellowship is an all-or-nothing fellowship. We are either together or we are separated. We are either effective or we are worthless. There really is no in-between. It does you no good to have a car that doesn't run, does it? You got a car that doesn't run, and all it does is sit there and rot. a church that doesn't run together, they are worthless. If anything, I'll even go so far as to say they are damaging to the cause of Christ. When you, I, over the years, I've watched different churches in different places, and there are too many churches that exist solely for the purpose of keeping a door open. What good does that do to the kingdom? What good does that do for Jesus? And honestly, doesn't that do damage when people go, well, if that's what those people who think they have the truth have to offer, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And they automatically turn away from what could be a, a soul-saving experience in teaching. That, that is so dangerous when we get sidetracked from being what God has called us to be. We need to be more demand. One of the most difficult parts of this whole thing is that it's difficult to know whether you even have this kind of fellowship or not. If you've never experienced the kind of interdependence community and identity and confidence and unity that goes with being a fellowship of God's people. All you've ever experienced is a group of strangers that gather together to meet their obligations, and that's how you picture and understand the church. That's what you're going to look for. You don't know that there's something better. But what we have described in Scripture is something better than that. I, I was telling somebody this the other day. Camp almost ruined me and my faith because it was so good. Many of y'all know I, I worked the Alabama camp. I grew up going to the Alabama camp. It was something that was a part of my life, something I loved. I loved that year, that, that week of the year. Every single year I looked forward to it. And I'm going to tell you, one of the reasons I looked forward to it was because it was a week at which there was genuine worship like I never experienced any other week. And it was a time where I had relationships with my peers in a way that I did not have relationship with my peers at home and my home congregation. 
It was a time of community that I couldn't experience anywhere else. And I still enjoy working that camp for the same reason, because I still get that sense of community with the other adults and with the kids. It is amazing the experience that you can have when you're joining together with people who love God like you love God and who want to worship God and want to give that a priority. It's amazing. And I tell you, it was really difficult for me as a new Christian, 14 years old, to come out of that week of camp and go home and just sit in a pew. Sing the same old song, hear the same old lessons, go through the same routine I've always gone through week after week, service after service. Wasn't close to anybody, and not necessarily because I didn't try, but because I was 14. Who was I going to be close to at 14? There wasn't another 14-year-old at church. So I wasn't close to anybody. I just kind of got drug along, and I sat in the pew, and I did my duties with a, in a room full of strangers. That about broke me. Because I wanted to have what I had during that week every week. And I wanted to have it with those people that I, I knew all of them. I knew their names. I'd been in a few of their houses. Uh, as a preacher's kid, I got more of those privileges than probably most people did. And my question was always, why can't we have what we had at camp at home? I'm 41 years old, and I'm still asking that question. Why can't we have that type of unhindered, devoted, and compassionate fellowship now? And let me tell you, if we did, this church would grow and there would be no stopping it. Because everyone would want to have a part of that. Brothers and sisters, that is what God has decreed for us. And I hope you want it too. If you're not a child of God, you can't have it. Because it is something that only belongs to those who identify with God. And if you are a child of God, you can have it, but you got to, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, continually devote yourself to it. Are you willing to give that much attention to it? I tell you right now, I've longed for it for decades. I hope you have too. It's a great thing to belong to God. And that invitation is yours today. If you don't yet belong to God, there's no reason not to. There's nothing stopping you from committing your life to him and having your sins washed away in baptism so that you can belong to him. And if you need that, we want to help you with that today. If you need the invitation to have your sins washed away and be made right with God,